Um, images. So I'll talk about images, gold, silver, or quicksand. Um, my name is Robert Schweikert. Um, I public cloud architect at SUSE, work within the ISV engineering team, and lead the public cloud team. Uh, from public cloud perspective, means my, my team, we touch anything that has anything to do with the public cloud. Um, our primary partners are um, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, uh, where we operate a lot of stuff. And so necessarily, we also deal with a lot of images. And um, that's basically more or less the background for, for this talk. So I will take a, um, I'll give a very brief history of computing, really very brief, uh, just as a little um, intro to set the stage. I'll provide some um, information about um, terms that I will use just so that we uh, all get on the same page and know what I'm talking about. And then we'll look at some image flavors. I'll talk a little bit about immutable infrastructure and give my thoughts about that. Uh, of course, immutable infrastructure is a very hot topic, especially in uh, connection with containers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about you know how to build images and, and what tools you can look at and how the build tools that you're using for images actually affect what, how, whether an image can be immutable or not, right? Because if you look at the Docker build tools, there are clearly some shortcomings uh, that many people not necessarily think about. And of course, it's not advertised, right? Because by those that love the stuff, they kind of paper over the not so pretty corners of the world. A brief history of computing. Uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far away, um, and yes, a new Star Wars movie is not too far away, which is great, uh, but we will not start there because then it would not be a brief history of computing and it would rather be a long story. But if you look back um, in the not so distant past, and actually, we still produce images that go on these shiny silver things that fit in the coffee holder trays on your computer. Um, oh, no, they're not really for coffee cups, I guess. Um, but they're somewhat obsolete. They're following the, uh, the way of that floppy thing that we started out with. Uh, most of the time these days, we work with um, USB sticks to install images or install operating systems or we work over the next work network with Pixie Boot or something like that. Um, and so there's a certain set of images that, well, we still burn ISO images on the server things or the hybrid images that are also known as .iso files. You can dump directly onto a USB stick. That's, of course, an image in, in a certain kind of way. Uh, many of these images wrap some other images. And uh, so since we're talking about images, if you look, um, still a somewhat dominant model and some emerging models. So today we still live in, in this world here and you can see the little red tabs here, one, two, and there will be four of those, which I will go into more detail later. Uh, basically we have some system, could be one server or a whole rack or whatever where somebody goes and installs an OS in some way, shape, or form, maybe with those or over Pixie Boot, and then people install their applications on top of that, right? So this is the typical enterprise application model. SAP, HPC applications, they run in this model, and we've been following this model for, what, 30, 40 years now? Um, starting from Unix and now all the way up to Linux, of course. Um, then, yeah, well, we need to make better use of our compute resources, so people came up with the idea of the virtualization. So instead of the host OS, we now have a hypervisor, which is, of course, considered a host OS as well. And then on top of that, we run one-to-end guests. Each of these guests is a virtual machine 
a virtual machine itself has an OS installed and an application. Um, and when I say application, there's a little bit of talk about what we can consider an application in, in the next section. Uh, of course, these virtual machines, you can you know, set them up on your own uh, by installing the OS from an image and then installing the application. Some application providers provide uh, so-called appliances. They give you everything you need in a virtual machine. Um, and of course, this also works in the cloud. Uh, and so basically, you have this hypervisor with the virtual machines. And then you have one virtual machine for maybe one application or one virtual machine for multiple applications. And again, we'll talk about more about what this application thing is, because that certainly has changed over, over time as well in just a little bit. So then number three, all the rage these days, that's the container stuff, right? So from the containers, you can look at this you know, two ways. Um, model number three here is you, you still end up with the hypervisor, right? And then you set virtual machines on top of that. And then you run containers inside the virtual machine, right? So this is what, um, this is number three is really what you get with the public cloud providers, right? They all have some kind of container service that they're offering now, um, often orchestrated with Kubernetes. And basically that's what you get there, right? Except that of course the hypervisor is provided by the cloud service provider. And then on top of that, there's some virtual machines that the containers run in, and that virtual machine has an operating system, right? Of course, you can set this up in your data center just as well. And uh, SUSE OpenStack Cloud 7 actually with Magnum basically follows this model. And then model number four, basically you control, well, you control the same thing. You have the host OS. This is where micro OS comes into play and container as a service platform that was just announced this week. So you have the host OS, which would in this case be micro OS. And then you run the containers directly on that, which runs directly on your, heart, on, on your hardware, right? So there's no hypervisor involved. You just have micro OS running and then you run your, uh, your containers on that. And you potentially can use some orchestration engine uh, like Kubernetes or Swarm or whatever to fiddle with your containers and deploy them as you see fit. So in a traditional model, and so now you can see we're, we're starting to talk about images in a traditional model. So you have one system that we always have. Uh, we always have to have hardware, no matter how hard we try. There has to be a processor and memory and all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's one operating system and one or more applications. Uh, so basically, we're dealing with one image. And that image is actually delivered to you by, let's say, us, SUSE. And you just install from scratch. And then, or you have a pre-built image, but there's really only, only one image to deal with. So that's not really all that complicated. But now, if we're looking at the next model up, virtualization and cloud, we obviously have the system, right? Again, we have the system, then we have the hypervisor, which is the OS, and we have one or many VMs, okay? And each of the VMs will have an operating system. So in this case, we will have at least two images, which means the hypervisor needs to get installed uh, from, from an image that could be scratch or a pre-built image. And then you have the guest image. And now you can go and say, okay, well, if my guest images contain different applications and I want to have different appliances, I would potentially have one image per guest appliance, right? So you can see here proliferation of images already in this model can go crazy very quickly, right? If you run 100 applications and you all build them into appliances, you're going to have 100 images that are laying around that you have to figure out how to manage, right? So you can see this is not at this point already, and we're only into model two, right? This is going up very quickly. In model three, okay, so now we're ending up with at least three images, right? Again, we have the host or hypervisor. On top of that, we have a VM, and inside the VM, we have the containers. So 
Now we're dealing with container images, we're dealing with a VM image, and we're dealing with the host image. Right? So now we're already up to three base images, and depending on how you build your containers and how you build your VMs, again, you can end up very quickly with 100 or more images that you need to deal with. So you can see this whole thing becomes very complex, and images go up from there, right? Again, and then in the, in the container running on the OS, you're going back to, well, at least two images, but if you, depending on how you build your containers, again, you may end up with hundreds. And so container management becomes important, not just at the run level, and of course there we have the orchestration engines, but also on how do you manage your images? How do you manage the environment where you build your images, right? That becomes very important. So, with this as background, let's make sure that we're all talking about the same thing, right? So let's talk about the golden image. So what we consider a golden image is an image that is finished. The image is basically finished. You do nothing to it. You drop it into whatever environment you have. You fire it up and it runs. So it has your application in it. It may do some configuration, right? So you may have some in, in the cloud, for example, you may run a cloud in it that then injects an SSH key, sets up the network, so some minor configuration, but the image itself is basically done. The application is installed. Everything is finished, right? Um, and every instance looks the same. So if you have 100, if you need to run 100 MySQL instances, then you just run 100 of these, and they just work, right? So now you have a golden image that you basically don't have to touch. Uh, and so let's consider that a golden image. Basically, just the golden image is basically finished. Not much is uh, necessary to, to deal with it, and you can just fire it up. A silver image is really just a base image, right? So you have a base image that needs, configure, uh, that needs configuration, uh, that needs some additional installation potentially, so these are basically the images that we provide in the public cloud, right? If you fire up a SUSE image in the public cloud, what you get is basically a silver image. We provide the basic uh, installation. If you're running on demand, the repositories are all pre already pre-registered, uh, pre and then you can just run Zipper in. Or you can hook the thing up to a configuration engine, may it be Sol, Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, Ansible if you really have to. Um, you know, whatever, and um, then from your server you can go and, and shove in there whatever you need, right? So you have a silver image, which is a base image that you then take and you configure as you see fit. Um, additional installation from the OS perspective, also additional installation from the application perspective, right? Of course, all, as I mentioned, all of this can be automated, uh, and, and so that's really uh, the silver image. And then, of course, you can have images that are both. And you can have a Russian doll game. And you can go on and on and on and on until you, you, know, you feel like in the, what is this, the, uh, the commercial where the head explodes with the purple cloud. <laughs> yeah. OK, so because in the end, right, I can build a golden image that's a VM. And inside that golden image, I can have a container which may also be a golden image, or my VM could be a silver image, and a container that's already built into the VM could be the golden image that I'm running. That's part of my application. And so I can play this Russian doll game until the dolls get so small that you really don't know what in the world is going on. So you really have to be careful with, uh, you know, you have to really think about when you're starting out, what is the purpose of this thing, and how much am I going to deploy it, do I really want to build a container potentially into my image already so that I make this a golden image, the wrapping image? Or is it better if I leave my VM as a silver image and then let a configuration engine like Salt put the packages on there and then let an engine like Kubernetes deploy the containers from there, right? So in the end, what you're doing, you have to decide where you want to be, where you want the complexity to be. You're not going to get rid of the complexity. These systems are now complex. There's no way around it. But you have to decide where is the least pain for 
your application for your, you know, for your purpose. You want a little more pain in the image building or you want more pain in the management, right? It's a pain equation, you're just shoveling the stuff around. And there's not really a good solution or a guideline. This is really different for every organization and for every application depending on how your processes are set up, right? If you're a pure DevOps shop, you're probably better building a silver base image and then uh, using Kubernetes or if you're running in the public cloud, something like you know, uh, code pipeline from AWS to do your deployment and just shovel the stuff right through there. Okay. So now let's talk about applications a bit, right? So we all, everybody talks about applications all the time. But this is of course heavily app overloaded, right? Because I think we probably can all agree that MariaDB is an application. Right? It's not part of the operating system. It runs on top of the operating system's application. But the problem is that, well, we also say this is an application. Well, this has now already two things. For you and I could say, well, Apache is an application. But when people say application, you don't really know whether they mean this or whether they mean this, right? And if I go into... Um, a full web application, right, this would actually, this bubble would actually get a lot bigger, right? It's not just the, the web server and a database behind it, right? There's a lot more stuff to it. So people talk about application when they say this, and people talk about application when they see just one of these. So that certainly makes the conversation in general more convoluted. Now, when people talk about an application container, on the other hand, they mostly mean something that wraps only one single application. Of course, application container concept itself has its issues, um, but I'm not gonna get into this because that's a whole nother topic uh, that I talked about last year. For the rest of this talk, primarily, we will consider an application to be the one box application, okay? One quote-unquote binary, such as um, one executable, think about, you know, MariaDB. Of course, MariaDB has shared libraries, and theoretically, they're really called executables as well, and so, you know, we can go and, again. Um, but the one executable and its dependencies is also the expectations of the so-called application container, or one, one application per container paradigm, right? And, and the idea of microservices, right? So microservices are basically, the idea is that whatever runs in the container provides one service, right? That's often implemented as a REST API, and then you would run, run one container per REST API, for example, right? So, uh, in practice, okay, containers are actually much closer to golden images than most of the VMs, um, but often, you know, some configuration is necessary. Um, containers, um, the decision came about, or the development came about that, yeah, configuration engines are not really what containers need, right, because configuration engines do way too much. What a container does, what a container needs when it does a golden image is really just, I need to connect to a network and I potentially have to connect to some other container that runs some other service, right? So a container that runs my web front end just may just need to connect to the database back end. And so there's really only two pieces of information that the container may need. And so that's stuff where, you know, etcd comes in, for example, that provides that information to the container. And so you can build a golden image of a container that just knows how to find etcd, and then from there it gets its configuration and knows what to connect to, and everything works wonderfully. And on the VM level, so the wrapper around these containers, they're really more like silver uh, images where you then end up you know, doing some additional configuration and some additional installation. The fun part, of course, of all of this is, you know, when you look at the networking, um, because you end up, especially if you're running this stuff in the cloud, 
you end up with a nested network that probably goes three, four, or maybe sometimes five layers deep, right? So first of all, you're going to have the software defined. Uh, first of all, you're going to have the network that is defined among um, the nodes of a cloud setup, like choose OpenStack Cloud. Um, and then on top of that, you're going to have a, a virtual network that allows the guest instances potentially to talk to each other. And if you're running containers inside of that, you're going to have another network nested inside of that that gets set up by the orchestration engine, such like Kubernetes, so that the containers can talk to each other. In addition to that, you're going to have to have routing that allows the containers to talk across instances potentially, right? So you're going from one virtual network over another virtual network so that they can, can hook things together. So with that in mind, let's talk about images and, uh, and flavors. So we, my team, we deal a lot with, you know, as I mentioned, the public cloud. So we already have three flavors that we deal with on more or less a daily basis. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to do a nice face flap here. Um, so we have uh, Amazon and Microsoft Azure and Google. So those are three different image flavors. Then, of course, there is uh, VMDK for VMware. Docker is an image format. QCOW, raw images. Um, ISO images, that's a different format, right? Anyway, so these that I have up here, they are all VM guests, right? And they're all different formats just for VM guests. And then, of course, you know, and Docker images are basically file system images. They have these layers uh, as they get built. Uh, but you can consider a, a container certainly, uh, you know, to be a VM guest. It's just managed differently and, and manifests itself differently in the kernel. Um, but in, in the end, it's just, it's just the guest image on some host. So given the complexity, uh, it is very important that you manage the sources of your images. Okay, so, so you have to think about right from the get-go when you want to build these things, how am I going to do this and how I'm going to manage those, right? And from that perspective, um, we come back to good old trusted revision control, right? Whatever your poison is, um, Git it should be, of course, but you know, if you think something else will work, then, then you can use that. Um, Kiwi and Docker is nice in that you can check the build descriptions into um, Git or whatever version control you're using, and then you always have a revision history of what is being changed, right? And then if you put processes in place, especially with container, it says don't touch the running system. If there's a change, rebuild the image, and you can, of course, put the same process in place with VMs. Rebuild the image instead of changing what you have, and then put it up there, right? But that also, comes along with a change in mindset, right? So people are starting to talk about, you know, pets versus cattle. Pets are the VMs or servers that we talk about. We give them nice funny names such as Chewbacca or Darth Vader, which may not be such a great name for a server, but people have been known to do that. Um, of course, that may just be the box that you, you know, but and, um, and of course, you know, in the container world, we talk about cattle, where we basically, uh, it's an image, it gets rebuilt. If it no longer works, we shoot it in the head, and then we stand up a new one, and we're done. Um, the important here is, of course, that we want to build in a repeatable environment, which means you either want to dedicate a system to actually build, to be your build server, right? So that not, so that you don't get random builds on random systems from people that you don't know what else may be on their system and what sources they're connected to, right? Where they would get their stuff from. Uh, and the open build service is such a tool that can give you uh, a way to set up a build, a build system that is repeatable, okay? And then important is to have glue code that binds it all together. So the build service, for example, already has hooks that you can tie directly into GitHub or in GitLab. You check in a change of your source description for the image build. 
and then the image would get rebuilt in the build service automatically and out comes your image and then that can of course trigger your test deployment and so on and so forth right but you can see there's a whole pipeline that still things need to be tied together okay so and with that since we're talking about tying things together let's talk about immutable infrastructure for a little while All right. Okay, immutable infrastructure. So the idea, uh, the idea of immutable infrastructure is basically fight human nature, right? Because this is human nature. Oh, this is just a simple issue. Ah, uh, you know, it's five o'clock. I want to go home, or it's midnight, and I want to go home, and I'm really way too tired to go and spend three hours to figure out what's really is because it's right obvious. It's one line change. So I want to make this one line change, and then your systems go down in the next two hours, and nothing works, and then you have yet a bigger problem, right? Uh, and yes, it even happened to Google not so not so long ago. If you uh, read their blog, this is dangerous, right? Um, obviously, this is dangerous. Um, we've been trying to find solutions to this problem for 40 years. ButterFS is one of those solutions because you can take a snapshot before, the, before, the, uh, before you make the change. And then if you're still there, when the thing falls apart, you can just roll back really quick. Of course, then you're stuck with the original problem, but that's a different, that's a different question, right? Anyway, so what do we do, right? What do we do to fight human nature of saying, this is an obvious fix and I'm just going to do it? Um, on this one system and I'll forget about the other 999 that I have running because I certainly don't want to log into any one of all of those and, and fix the problem in the same way. Um, so one of the fixes is clearly don't touch the running system, right? Don't ever modify the running system. This is how we come up with the idea of having an immutable infrastructure. Of course the problem is in reality, this is not really possible, right? And people that say otherwise, they're really just dreamers and fanboys. Uh, the reason for that is that, first of all, any of the dynamic languages which are mostly prevalent in, in containers to run applications have some kind of package management system. They do. Ruby does, Python does, Java, Node.js, right? And as long as this thing has access to the internet, there is nothing that prevents somebody that is really tired and just wants to get something done and get out of the way to run pip install my favorite Python module and then import. And go so now I just broke my immutable infrastructure, right? The other problem, of course, is that people are allowed to log in to begin with, right? So in very early versions of Docker, actually, uh, they were kind of true to the immutable infrastructure because you couldn't log into the container. And then people figured out that if I can't log into the container, it's really hard to debug my application, right? And so what did we do? Ah, we let you log in to the container. So that means Yes, we opened the door to all of this. So we still very much depend on training our people, right? We still very much depend on don't touch the system, and if you do, I'm going to slap your fingers. Same thing we've done for 40 years, which is interesting, right? So now we've done all these wonderful things, and we're still at the beginning. We're still fighting human nature. Okay. So we still have to train people to do the right thing. But with the new tools that we have, it is actually easier than, than it used to be because we can crank out image builds relatively quickly, especially container builds are fast, but even building a VM with Kiwi is a relatively fast thing, right? So somebody can go in, change the source control of your Kiwi build, and, and then have a, a new image pop out, maybe a container or a virtual machine. So now we talk about building images, right? So here's, here's um, there's some tools that we have, uh, virtual machines, 
Kiwi and uh, Sousa Studios. Sousa Studios, of course, just a wrapper around Kiwi. Generally, these uh, create mutable systems, okay? They, that means they have an update stack, plus all the stuff with the, uh, you know, with the dynamic languages that are already managed. Um, these systems can easily be set up to automatically connect to SUSE Manager, right? So if you have SUSE Manager in your environment, you can, you know, do push updates and things like that. Or they can connect to SCC or SMT for a pull model, okay? Uh, if you have images uploading to the, to the cloud, um, from our perspective, we have EC2 upload image. So if you pop out uh, an image that is destined for um, for Amazon, you can use EC2 upload image. Um, it's actually really the only tool that, that does what, what this tool does, uh, which is create an image for you from, from a certain build configuration in, in Amazon. Everything else is really painful, don't do it. We have Azure Control, which is a tool chain that my, my team is developing that basically does the same for, for Azure. And then Google, there's Google Cloud SDK, and then of course OpenStack, you can import images really easily once they're in QCOW format or even RAW format, right? So, so, that, so from that perspective, so that deals with the cloud. But now if we look at building containers, right, then um, containers, often we want something that is more difficult to change, right? So, so in the VM world, we don't really talk so much about the immutable infrastructure because VMs are often, as I mentioned, silver images. So we know in a VM, oftentimes we have to go in and we have to fiddle with it, right? In some way, shape or form. But for a container, which is a golden image, that's really where we strive to have this immutable infrastructure, right? And I already showed you that there is a big flaw. Another big flaw in this is that when you build a container using the Docker tools, Docker build, right, what do you do? You start with a base image that's provided, for example, by us, or you build your own base image, or you pull it from Docker Hub, which is finally after, what, five years, they figured out that it's a good idea to sign their images. <laughs> oh. um, Anyway, so you can now get signed images from Docker Hub and can verify that they are actually the same than the original publisher has intended. Um, but the big problem here is when you build with Docker build, you need the update stack, right? Because Docker build depends on issuing commands such as super in or yum or app get or whatever, because in your Docker file, you will probably install MariaDB or whatever, right? So here's your problem, right? Another break in the idea of the immutable infrastructure, because if I put an update stack into the image and I let somebody log into the image, well, now I'm back to what the VM is. I can log in and I can run inside the VM, I can use the update stack, and I can access all the repositories in the world. So now I just completely broke the idea of having an immutable infrastructure, right? So this is completely backwards. If you build your containers with Kiwi, you can actually build a container image that does not have an update stack. So once you have that, then you're only left with the problem of preventing people from running CPAN or pip install or NPM or Ruby gem install or whatever it is, gem install, right? Any of those. So that's actually a little more difficult than just running in, you know, zipper, zipper in or zipper up, right? So if you build with Kiwi over Docker, if you build your Docker containers with Kiwi, you have the big advantage that there is no update stack in the image. And even though people can log in, they can't just run zipper up to update the running container, or they can't just run zipper in to install yet another package that's not in the original image build, right? So, so Kiwi as a tool actually is much better um, to help you fulfill the need of the immutable infrastructure than, you know, the guys that came up with the idea of, oh yeah, we'll, we'll run Docker build and we use the update stack. No, now I don't have immutable infrastructure anymore, right? So in summary, and this was really fast, 
which is nice. You get some time back. And am I the last one before the party? That's even better, see? Um, so in summary, uh, you know, what you want to do is, uh, in, in today's world, it's almost impossible to get away without images. You are going to touch images in some way, shape, or form, right? Uh, your data center probably has some virtualization. Your data center is most, most likely going to move to some kind of cloud environment. Uh, if you even contain a data center, right? Uh, there are many people that get rid of their data centers and they just run all their stuff in the public cloud. Most likely you're going to have some kind of mixed environment, a hybrid cloud running a cloud environment in your data center and using um, the public cloud. So in this environment, it is impossible to get away without touching images. So you want to think about how you want to handle your images, how do you want to build your images, how do you manage them, not just from an operational perspective, right, but from a build perspective as well. Right? Just knowing that I have an image named ABC and then having a spreadsheet that says image ABC contains MariaDB and this version of SSL, now that's not going to work, right? You need something more reliable. So build your images with a tool like Kiwi or again, Docker build if you absolutely must. Um, but remind yourself when you run Docker build, you're not getting an immutable image because you have the update stack in the image. This is unavoidable with Docker build, right? You must have the update stack in the image. Again, the nice thing about this is you check your build description into source code, revision control, and then you know exactly what's in it, right? You know against which repository you're building, right? And from there, you know what's in the image. And what's in the image is important, right? Because guess what? Dirty cow, shell shock, you name them, right? They exist and they will not go away. There will be others this year that will be found, right? They exist. So this is really important, and not just from an operational point of view, but also from a design and implementation point of view of where you have to say, how do I manage my image builds, and how do I correlate the images that I'm building to what's actually out in operation, right? So you might even go in and, and uh, set up a little database for yourself that says, this image build is correlated to instances that are named or images that are named according to this naming pattern or whatever, right? So, so those are things that you need to think about. Uh, use pliable pre-built images wherever possible, right? So use these silver images or use pre-built silver images like we provide, for example, in the public cloud, right? They're basic images. Uh, you get them from a trusted source. They're built only from the SLES repositories. Use those images wherever possible. Stick some configuration management in there so it can help you track what changes are being made to these systems. Okay. Again, consider the goals of what you're running, right? If you're running an application that has to be, uh, you know, quote unquote 100% reliable, right? Think about your HA setup, right? Am I going to have the, uh, an HA setup where I just run many of them and stick them behind a load balancer and then when one goes away, it's not that big of a deal? Or am I going to have a more traditional HA setup with failover where the application is being monitored, right? So if one goes down, there's only one other or two other instances and then I fail over transparently to that. So, so those are things you have to consider. Um, Often in, the, in, in today, in you know, many of the applications that we have today still fall into the pets category, right? And many of those applications will stay that way. I don't see SAP, for example, to become a cattle-based application, right? It's too big, it's too complicated, um, but there's certainly, you know, uh, different applications that take different approaches that can easily be stuck in containers and be uh, micro um, be architected for microservices. Okay, 
So from my perspective, consider image management, not just from the operational side, but also from the design and building perspective as a top priority um, as you're moving forward into this fantastic, brave new world of images, cloud, private cloud, public cloud, containers, micro S's, and let's see, what other buzzwords did I just miss? <laughs> so, and with that, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, time for beer. <laughs>